Hello, I'm David McNamee, and today I'm going to be presenting my financial analysis of Garmin Limited. Before we begin, I'm going to go over what we're going to talk about during this presentation. We're going to break it into a few different parts, the first being the background of the company, and talk about a little bit what they do and who they are, and then we'll get into a SWOT analysis, that's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And then after that, we're going to go into the annual report and take it from an overview and then dissect it financial statement by financial statement. We will begin with the balance sheet, then we'll go to the income statement, and then we will go to the market capitalization. And then after that, we're going to talk about the financial ratios that are uh, derived from those financial statements. And then once we talk about those ratios, we'll do some analysis and come up with uh, what we think that the company is worth, what the value of the company is. And then we'll wrap it all up by explaining what the uh, conclusion would be based on our analysis and based on what the current stock market prices are doing for the company. So let's uh, begin with the company background. Garmin manufactures and produces, they sell and market GPS devices. Now these GPS devices come in various sizes and uh, they have various different functions. They're from handheld for hiking to uh, wrist monitors for fitness and that kind of thing, as well as uh, portable and fixed mounted for both vehicles and for aviation and uh, the like. Garmin continues to innovate and they often have uh, several things that they do to continually uh, get the cutting edge of technology. Garmin Limited is broken up into three companies, the Garmin Corporation, which is based out of Asia. They uh, manufacture and they do distribution of GPS products to the Asian market, including the Far East. Then there is Garmin International, which supports the Americas, so North and South America. They do sales and marketing. And then there's Garmin Europe Limited, which does sales and marketing to Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the SWOT analysis. Now, when we think about Garmin, there are many things that they have a strength in, and uh, particularly they uh, are very good at making accurate and reliable GPSs. Uh, Garmin owns its own manufacturing facilities, which aids in its ability to create their products. And this uh, also allows them to kind of decide what uh, their manufacturing costs are going to be to some extent. Their manufacturing facilities are in Asia, which gives them the ability to work and develop products at a much lower cost. So their weaknesses are Garmin doesn't own the satellite system that the GPS uses. Uh, that is managed by the Department of Defense. Because of that, we'll get down to some threats, um, but we'll leave that until that point. Um, and then the, another weakness is the GPSs are very similar. Uh, you have one in your phone, undoubtedly. And that's very similar to the kind of GPS that Garmin makes. And so that's another weakness because it's not really differentiated that much. There's some opportunities that, Google, that uh, Garmin could seek out the automotive industry and make some proprietary GPS systems for the vehicles and cars. As well as uh, they could reach out to different third-party apps like Google Maps and Maps.me and other third-party map providers to kind of uh, bring a, a bigger bond with the end user and the functionality of their GPS's. There's a few threats that we have to mention 
and that's uh, that there's continual entrance into the GPS market. Like I said, uh, your phone undoubtedly has a GPS in it, and uh, because they're very easy to make now, there's a lot of new competitors uh, that are continually entering into the, the market. Another thing is that there's a saturation of GPSs, uh, as going back to the phone example, um, there's several, several companies that make GPS devices and it's becoming a saturated market. And then uh, lastly, because there could be increased restriction by the Department of Defense on who is authorized to use the GPS satellites, uh, Garmin could face some restrictions as to who they're able to market to in the future. Now the annual report of Garmin, uh, there's a few notes uh, in the 10K that I'd like to mention. First of all, uh, the fiscal year ends on 12-31-2016. And that's a, just a coincidence because they don't go on a calendar year. Uh, in fact, 2016 was a 53-week year, so I've had to back out everything to uh, be a 52-week year, and all of the ratios and percentages reflect 52 weeks as opposed to 53. And then uh, they were issued an unmodified opinion by Ernst & Young, who are their auditors, and there was nothing notable that Ernst & Young made in their report. So... Going on to the balance sheet for 2016, uh, the total assets were about $4.525 billion, or $4,525 million. Uh, current assets make up just a little bit over half of that. And cash sec and, ca uh, and marketable securities make up 24.61% of total assets. Now, total liabilities are very limited um, and the reason that they're very limited is because there's no debt by Garmin. Garmin is one of the few companies that has a remarkable balance sheet and they were able to attain it without any debt or rather they currently do not have any debt and because of that everything that is a liability is operating related and total liabilities make up about 24.47 of liabilities and, and stockholders equity. Conversely, total stockholders equity makes up about 75% of the liabilities and stockholders equity. Going towards the income statement for 2016, they had net sales of uh, $2.962 billion, and they had a cost to get sold of $1.3 billion. Now, as a percentage of sales, cost of goods sold was 44.36%, and uh, gross profit then is $1.6 billion, or 55.64% of total sales. Uh, there's two main expenses on the income statement and that is selling general and administrative for 402 million dollars or 13.6 percent of total sales and research and development because Garmin is continually trying to get to the cutting edge and trying to maintain their competitive advantage over the competition they have to spend a lot of money in research and development and that is how we get to the 459 million dollars which is 15.5% of total sales. Now, because they have so much money, uh, they have a lot of investments. If you recall, half of uh, all of the current assets are basically in cash, cash equivalents and marketable securities, and that uh, really gives them a lot of money to make some, make some interest and so they are able to get $33 million in 2016 just in interest, and that's 1.11% of total sales. Um, and then the big thing that they have is uh, foreign currency losses, losses in the exchange rate between currencies, 
and that uh, basically eats up about almost all of the interest income. $31 million is lost because of that foreign currency. Now going back to 2014, now this is 2016 right here, but going back to 2014, that loss was a lot less. It was only about $4 million. And then in 2015, it jumped up to $25 million. And then in 2016, we're at $31 million in a loss now. But even with that, we're still at about uh, $501 million for net income, which is about 16.92% of total sales. In comparison to 2015, sales went up, cost of goods sold went down, selling general and administrative went down, interest income was up, um, and unfortunately this foreign exchange loss was also up, which is a bad thing, we want that to be down. Uh, but net income was still up, so all, all in all, it was still a good year for Garmin. Going on to the statement of cash flows uh, statement, we were able to get uh, $692 million from operating activities, and that is uh, about $190 million more than net income was, so quite a bit uh, being brought in from operating activities. And this was much greater than 2015. 2015 was a bit of a, a less than stellar year for Garmin, but uh, still profitable. And then they had a cash flows for investing activities because they're investing so much. That was an outflow of $119 million. And then uh, cash flows from financing activities. This, uh, this is a use of $551 million. Now you say to yourself, how do they have $551 million of financing activities when they don't have any debt? And the answer is that they pay a ton of dividends. Um, in this year, they paid $472 million in dividends and they paid $80 million uh, net to purchase back treasury stocks. So net because they repurchased some treasury stock as well as uh, they reissued some of their treasury stock. Then going on to the market capitalization, the book value of stockholders equity is uh, $3.4 billion with the number of shares outstanding $188 million at a share price on December 31st, 2016 of $48.49. This creates a $9.145 billion dollar market capitalization. Now as we've uh, examined some of our financial statements and got a couple of the um, big numbers and big items there, uh, it's time to move on to the financial ratios. Now the first thing that we're going to do is talk about return on equity and in 2016 it's up over the past two previous years it's 14.82% Previously, in 2015, it was 13.52 percent, and in 2014, uh, we're at 10.31 percent. Return on that net assets um, is down this year over last. Uh, now, it's interesting because uh, when you look at this as a 53 year, 53 uh, week year, it's actually up. But when you adjust it back down to a 52. Uh, week year, it's actually down from the previous year. So we're at 42.57% in 2016 over 45 and 41 in the previous years. Now uh, net <clears throat> operating profit margin is up over the last two years um, and net operating asset turnover is what is bringing us down. So that's what's reducing our return on net, net assets here. 2.54 this year versus 2.87 and 3.41 in the previous years. Going to the current and the quick uh, ratios, the current ratio is 2.89 uh, and that's up from the 2.55 and 2.43 uh, and the quick is uh, 2.1 in 2016 1.82 in 2015, 1.87 in 2014. And that's, a, a remember 2015 was kind of a, a rough, rough, less than stellar year. So it took a little bit of a dip and now it's back to 
to being better than it was in 2014. And then liabilities to equity, there's so little liabilities that it's really only 0.32 uh, is the, the ratio there of equity to of liability to equity. And that's uh, steadily decreasing from 0.38 in 2014 to 0.35 in 2015, and now we're down to 0.32 in 2016. Now, um, based on the book calculations, times interest earned, operating cash flows, and free cash flows, uh, they're unable to be computed due to no debt. Each one of these uh, divides by debt, and because we have no debt, we can't divide by zero. So if we go by the formulas in the book, uh, it's not possible to do that. Uh, there are other formulas out there, and I've seen um, the amounts on various websites, but I'm not confident in them enough to display them. Um, and then we get to days of inventory outstanding, which is 135 days. Now, I should mention uh, the main competitor here for Garmin is TomTom Tom and Magellan. Um, both of which are very uh, difficult companies to value. Uh, Magellan, because it uh, you can't really get any financial statements that are just associated with Magellan, and TomTom, Tom because they're a Netherlands company that uh, do not file with the SEC. And so that's difficult to kind of get uh, apples to apples there. But um, for days of inventory outstanding, TomTom Tom is actually only 40 46, 47 days, and uh, it's right about the same for days of sales outstanding, um, which is kind of kind of interesting since uh, Garmin has 135 days of inventory outstanding and 65 days of sales outstanding and 48 days of payables outstanding. This brings a cash conversion cycle of 152 days, which is a really long time from when you uh, purchase inventory to when you sell inventory to when you get money for it. Um, it it's uh, comparative to TomTom. TomTom's Tom. only about uh, 23 days is all the, their cash conversion cycle. Um, and it, it's, it's pretty crazy. Uh, comparatively, Garmin is still um, on the, the same scale um, they're comparatively still doing better as far as net income goes and as far as profitability, um, even though they have such a, a much slower cash conversion cycle. And then one thing to note, uh, because they have so little debt, their Z-score is huge. It, it's up to 7.06, which is very remarkable. Uh, definitely don't have a whole lot of fear that a Garmin is going to go down the tube anytime soon with, with that big of a Z-score. Uh, another disclaimer is that uh, because they don't use debt, I wasn't able to find any bond information, so I don't know their credit rating. Uh, that's not uh, anything that is publicly known. Then going on to the company valuation now, um, we were able to discover that WAC was about 9.55%. Uh, and one of the big reasons for that is uh, their cost of equity. Um, they, they spend a lot on equity. Um, you know, they, they used a lot of money this last year just in dividends. And uh, that, you know, that kind of drives a lot. Um, the, I was able to determine that the total firm value is about $10.6 billion dollars. And uh, with 188 million shares outstanding, uh, that gives us a per share price of $56.36. Now, if we go back to um, what our market capitalization was, uh, we were only about $48, which uh, this amount would, would indicate that we're undervalued and that, that Garmin is actually worth more than what it was trading at. Um, however, since then, we were able to find that uh, that the stock prices have increased. And I believe on my next slide I show that. Um, so our overall evaluation of Garmin as a whole, they're they're doing it really well as a company. Uh, they're they're doing strong uh, 
continuing to, to really blow everybody out of the water as far as uh, how much net income they're able to maintain and how much uh, is a percentage of sales, how much they're able to keep. Um, it's a very strong company as far as liquidity and solvency. Uh, definitely not any, any problems in the near future to the long-term future as far as cash goes. They're, they're sitting on a ton of cash and cash equivalents and marketable securities. Um, and because of that, they have a very strong Z-score. And like I said, they're very like, unlikely to fail in the near future. Um, something to note is that they could achieve a much cheaper cost of capital through debt. 9.55% is pretty uh, high, and uh, with, with uh, the amount that Garmin has going for it, they could get that down very easily to a much lower cost of capital. And then, uh, as I said before, it seems that they're slightly undervalued um, compared to the December 31 stock price, uh, but the current stock price is $60.85, so now it, it's about evened out, so it was 48, 56 is what we say that, uh, what I said that the value should be, and we're at 60 now, so it's right around there. Pretty, pretty accurate, I think. So that concludes uh, our analysis of Garmin. I hope you learned a little bit and uh, enjoyed the, the time. So thank you very much.